this is the quote, because I think it's um, very appropriate for what we're discussing tonight, that Marxists argue that no economic, political, or social phenomenon can be fully understood without taking into account its historical development. No struggle takes place within a vacuum. No struggle is isolated from the general laws of nature and society. Marxists are materialist, not idealist. Marxists know that being, de being determines consciousness, that what people think does not drop from the sky, but is conditioned by their social experiences, end quote. Now I want to come out and say right from the jump, and we all know this, that Donald Trump is a white supremacist, misogynist scum of the earth, and he has opened up another front of the racist war against black and brown people and that front is the National Football League Players Association. That's right. The article that I wrote was mainly a news article that includes a summary of a spontaneous response, and I mean spontaneous, that's very important, to Trump's demeaning remarks towards members who play in the most popular professional team sports in the U.S. A league that is 70% African American, with no African American majority owners of an NFL team, and there are no African American CEOs or presidents in the league. This is a league whose fan base is 83% white in terms of being able to afford to attend these games. And by the way, most of the stadiums are located in predominantly white suburbs. In terms of the other two of the other um, pro leagues in the country, that's the National Basketball Association, the Major League Baseball, and, no and National Hockey League, the average salary for a pro football player is the lowest of all of them. And that's less than two million dollars a year. Now people look at Tom Brady and those who know football, Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, and they make tens of millions of dollars a year, but the average salary is 1.9 million dollars a year. And the irony of this is that although the NFL is the most popular pro uh, league, it has the shortest playing span of four years or less due to debilitating injuries, including life-threatening concussions, like CTE. Of course, to the average worker, especially a low-wage worker at McDonald's or Burger King's or any other place, $1.9 million is a lot of money. But when compared to the multi-billionaire majority white owners, who view these teams and the players as just an investment, as commodities, it remain, still remains a boss-worker relationship. These are gladiators. And they're supposed to shut up and just play sports. That's what expected of all of them. So many of the players were so pissed off when Trump demanded that the owners fire any player that took a knee and then called them SOBs to boot. And it really pissed these players off because the vast majority of them were raised by single mothers who had to work two and sometimes three jobs just to make ends meet for them and their children. A lot of times these mothers went without eating to make sure they had food on the table. So for Trump to call them SOBs was not only an insult to them as black men, but a double insult because of the, what, you know, what they call their mothers. So making, uh, for, for a lot of these players, and it's about 53, 60 players on each team, not all of them get a chance to play either. This is a dream come true to make it in the NFL or any pro league. So how should we view this phenomenon? And it is a phenomenon as Marxists. And I want to just go back to one quote again. That we, our, uh, Mar Marxists argue that no economic, political, or social phenomenon can be fully understood without taking into account its historical development. Now historically, 
black athletes have been pioneers when it comes to fighting for racial equality, be it on the field or off the field, whether there is a movement or whether there isn't a movement. We can go all the way back to Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight boxing champion, who was threatened with lynching constantly because all of his opponents, which he beat to a pulp, were white, and so was his partner. Or better known legendary uh, athletes like Jesse Owens, Joe Lewis, Jackie Robinson, who of course we all know broke the color barrier in baseball. And by the way, he refused to you know, honor the anthem because of how he, the heinous treatment that he took on and off the field. But a, probably the most conscientious and most influ influential athlete of all was Muhammad Ali, who refused to fight in Vietnam, and his punishment was being robbed of his prime years of boxing. But the difference between Ali and the previous black athletes that I mentioned were the social movements that, Muhammad, that, that influenced Muhammad Ali and of course, Ali influenced these movements as well. They were the Black Liberation Movement and the Anti-War Movement. And then, one year after Ali refused the draft, there were Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who with raised fists and bowed heads, as the anthem was being played, used the 1968 Olympics as a worldwide platform. They used it as a platform to protest racist inequality. And of course, they were sent home immediately and ostracized for most of their rest of their lives, although now they're being sort of vindicated because of what's happening now. But there, of course, there was many, many other athletes, both known and unknown, who took heroic stances <laughs> fighting against white supremacy. But let's fast forward to almost 50 years later to Colin Kaepernick. And I wanted to show this. This is, this is the new tomorrow, or today, this is the new issue of Sports Illustrated, which is probably the most prominent sports magazine in the country. And it's, it says, a nation divided, sports united. And you look here, you have LeBron James, you, ha you have um, Steph Curry. I, I'm sure most people know that Trump just disinvited the Warriors because of what Steph Curry said <laughs> about Trump, that he would not go, and, no, and a, a number of the players said they wouldn't go either. This is his coach, Steve Kerr, who's been very, very critical um, of Trump. And of course, Candace Parker, you know, very, uh, the, the WNBA has been very outspoken, very outspoken against Trump. And, and for Black Lives Matter, even before Trump was even uh, elected. Uh, this is Bruce Maxwell. Bruce Maxwell is the first, he's African American right here. He's the first player in the Major League Baseball who took a knee. He's with the Oakland uh, Athletics. This is Michael Bennett. Michael Bennett is like, um, he's like the Colin Kaepernick, you know, that's playing now. He's the one that was brutalized by the Las Vegas police and very, very outspoken. He refused to go to Palestine. He refused to go to Israel because of how the Palestinians were being treated. Um, but the other, but the, the, the uh, one of the contradictions is that this is Roger Goodell, who is the NFL commissioner. Now, why is he there? He makes 30 to 40 million dollars a year and he represents the interests of the owners. And this is, um, I forgot his name, but he's the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's the only non-white non team owner. But he's, I think he's South Asian, I believe. I'm not sure what his nationality is. But look at the cover, and you can see right off who's missing. Kaepernick, Kaepernick. Kaepernick is missing from this. In fact, both Steph Curry and Steve Kerr were very upset that their, their pictures were even on the, on the um, cover. They both came out and said how terrible it was that Kaepernick was not on this cover because he's the one who started it all. So I just wanted to bring this to, you, to your attention because Sports Illustrated has gotten a lot of flack for this cover. 
they're claiming, well, you know, we wanted to show this is the more current situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but anyway, it's just absurd. It's really absurd. Anyway, I just wanted to show this cover because you're going to see a lot of it. But, you know, Colin Kaepernick, as we all know, took this heroic stance more than a year ago when first he sat and then he started to take a knee to protest racist police brutality. Not for just one game or two games or three games, but for the entire 2016 NFL season. And he is, being, he is paying the price by being whiteballed by the same owners who will not hire him for the 2017 season. At least seven of these owners were outright Trump supporters. They gave money to his uh, political uh, campaign. Kaepernick evolved as a leading voice of the Black Lives Matter struggle without saying too much or attending marches or rallies, but he didn't have to because he had such a visible platform on the field and also on social media. But as it turned out, what he did say and what he did do still resonates in such a profound way today. And of course, this brings me to what happened on Sunday, September 24th, when an unprecedented sports event took place. This is unprecedented. You don't have 200 players on one given Sunday come out in some form of protest. Now, they didn't, did they have political demands? Not, not really. Um, did they get, did they, uh, did the political message of police brutality and racist oppression, repression get lost in the long run? Except in a few instances, yes it did. It really did. And a lot of sports, black sports commentators are pissed off about this and everything. But, but even how the athletes review their actions on Sunday, um, it wasn't united. You know, some sat, some, you know, um, they kneeled, they locked arms. Some of, them, some of them didn't even come out of the locker room. Like three teams didn't come out of the locker room, <laughs> you know, because, because they, were, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. Some wanted to protest, some didn't want to protest. So there wasn't a you know, unanimous way or united way of showing some type of you know, um, you know, anger towards Trump uh, because there are varying political views amongst the players. Even it just came out today that the Carolina Panthers, who, who have one of the most, if you can call them the most conservative team owners, Jerry Richardson, they were afraid. They, they actually said they were afraid to protest. Oh, wow. And six of their team captains bet with Jerry Richardson and said, listen, is it okay if we can protest? And he said, whatever y'all want to do, you know, go ahead and do it. But that's, that's what I mean. They didn't, even pro they didn't do anything. <laughs> so we'll see what happens this Sunday. But, but what's so important about Sunday was that it showed the potential the potential of the power that these players have due to Trump's racist, anti-workers arrogance, bringing them together. This is bringing them together. And this is the first big step in terms of moving forward, you know, to them realizing how much of a united force, what a power they have as workers. And as Brian Gumbel stated on HBO's Real Sports, he said, quote, thanks Trump for energizing social consciousness of all athletes to stand for something, to stand for something. And I think that's very, very important. Energizing social consciousness. Isn't that what we want for all the workers? To be socially conscious, to be class conscious? And many of these players will even, they'll get a better understanding because now Trump is discontinued. Trump put out 24 tweets within, I forgot, a weekend, he didn't say anything about Puerto Rico. Right. Yeah, right. But he had 24 tweets against these players. And against the owners, calling them afraid, call, you know, and, and virtually calling them cowards because they allowing these protests to go on and they all should be fired and so forth. So it even brings to light what Jamel Hill said from ESPN. When she said on Twitter, 
Trump is a white supremacist, and everybody around him are white supremacists too. And she was almost fired by ESPN. But there was, I think there was so much support for her amongst her colleagues and others that they really couldn't do it. They tried to get someone to take her place. Um, you know, she's, um, she does a sports center in, in probably the prime time, 6 p.m. They tried to get somebody to replace her and nobody would do it. Wow. <laughs> because they knew it would be scabbing. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, but in the long run, the, the greatest singular impact of all, of all for these players will be Kaepernick because of the issue of police brutality. Because, you know, throughout their lives, their young lives, they have had, you know, encounters with the police. All of them, all of these black players, you know, in one way or the other. Um, and as much as the right wing and bourgeois pundits, they want to talk about, you know, the flag, it's disrespecting the flag, it's disrespecting the anthem and the military, uh, and it, you know, being dissed by these protests, it all comes back as to why Kaepernick took a knee in the first place and why he chose the anthem as a platform to get his message across. And more and more of these players are making this connection because Trump's solidified his relations with white supremacists in Charlottesville. They talk about that, you know, and the protests against the Confederate statues. And many of these players spoke about Kaepernick and how much he has sacrificed his career, because he may not ever play another game. But he said that's okay. You know, he's ready to play, but he said if I don't play, I'm not gonna give up my principles. But he said that, because he's all about social change. He's all about social change. And many of these players are, are going to come to the realization that, that the only way they can make a difference is if they become a unified force. It starts as individuals, of course, you know, but what is really needed is a broad, united NFL force to fight not only Trump and what Trump represents, because Trump represents white supremacy. He represents white supremacy. In fact, you know, um, the backlash that is happening is just really horrendous. Just a few examples um, because of, you know, um, you know, what Trump is putting out there. Um, that some Louisiana high school yep. principal put out a letter on Twitter saying that any of their players that take a knee, they're going to be expelled from the football team. That's right. And also some Missouri bar owner put out a, you know, Monchon Lynch is a very famous running back for the Seattle Seahawks. He sits, you know, he's not very verbal as to why he sits during the national anthem, but he sits, he's always sat during the national anthem. Right. They put his jersey, which is Lynch, next to Kaepernick's uh, jersey. Lynch, Kaepernick. Right. On the ground. On the ground. Right. So people could just walk on it, wipe their feet. Wipe their feet. So these are some of the things that are, you know, happening. Some of the backlash, but the, but the but the players are really speaking out. Like Richard Matthews from the Tennessee Titans said, he's going to continue to take a knee until Trump apologizes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "quote oh, he I know I know." So, but this is his quote. He says, "I'm tired of hearing stick to sports." It comes down to right and wrong in this world. If you see wrong and you don't say anything, if you see wrong and don't say anything, that's wrong. As minorities, what do you want to happen before we say anything? They tried to have a silent protest and look what happened. It's your right to stand or sit down. You have that right, that freedom of speech, and you're not allowing that to happen. We're not rag dogs. We're people just like you. And that's end quote. And he, he also mentioned Kaepernick too. Uh, but it really reflects, what he's saying reflects how a growing number of players are viewing themselves and the world. And it really boils down to them becoming more and more, their, their being is, is, is determined by, uh, by their consciousness. And while these athletes are experiencing their own metamorphosis of change in social consciousness, at the same time their actions are encouraging others to take a stand, especially against police brutality. So there is the backlash, but people are really, you know, I mean from all walks of life are being impacted by, by this. Uh, the same day that Trump made his racist 
a rant in Alabama, I love this. A group of white residents in uh, Queens, I believe, they held a banner inside of Mets Stadium, the New York Mets, while the anthem played that said, quote, this is us taking a knee. Black Lives Matter. These were just ordinary residents. But what they did before they did that, they consulted with their black neighbors to see if this was okay for them to do. Wow. And the neighbor said, yes. <laughs> I mean, this is a really a beautiful display of anti-racist solidarity. And this is, and also these scientists from around the world, they all took a knee. You know, because they're seeing what's happening with climate, climate change and so forth, but they wanted to show their solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, so this is, you know, an Asian doctor in some hospital. He just took a he just took a picture of himself. He said, "I'm an Asian American doctor, and I'm for Black Lives Matter." Wow. You know, it's just stuff like this. Just you know, it just <laughs> it just really you know gives you a lot of optimism. Um, so let's see. So I mean, these young men are becoming, as, they, as the young gen generation says, woke, um, and they're not being lulled back to sleep. They're not going to be lulled back to sleep due to Trump and also everything that is happening from Charlottesville to to NASCAR. You see what's happening with the NASCAR, which is like Confederate flags are everywhere. You know, it's awful. But Dale. Uh, Earnhardt Jr., you know, who's the son of this legendary yeah, yeah. race car, he came out and said they have a right to protest. This is a NASCAR wow. driver. <laughs> wow. You know, he came out in support of the protests. It's re and um, so, so you know, and and uh, and the whole issue of being patriotic. You know, they say, well, the players are not being patriotic because they're, you know, doing this during the anthem and so forth. Well, we don't give a damn. We don't want them to be patriotic. <laughs> we don't want them to be patriotic. Just as we don't want our entire class to be patriotic, we want them to be unpatriotic. You know, um, because we want them to become revolutionary. Just like we want our entire class to be the revolutionary agent of change. And I think we have a lot of confidence that's, that that's going to happen. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. So I just really want to hear what people have to say. I really want to hear what the, you know, the questions and comments are. But I just end with this point, that what is going on today with Trump and all that he represents, which is white supremacy, declaring war on the NFL, has all the makings of a major explosion because the players are now taking sides. It's a question of choosing which side are you on. And when they take the side of Kaepernick, it means that they're taking the side of Black Lives Matter. And what is happening in the NFL and sports in general, this is really a, a great development in helping for, for, our, you know, for advancing the class struggle in general. Um, because these are oppressed workers, well paid, but they're oppressed workers. And with short you know, uh, life's, uh, uh, playing uh, spans, they face tremendous, you know, um, the injuries that they face, you know, they, they never go away. A lot of players have died because they never got the health care that they needed, just like a lot of the workers are going to be losing their, hair, their health care, you know, which uh, you know, Trump and his ilk are trying to do. Um, so we really feel this is going to really help advance the overall struggle of the workers and the oppressed towards an anti-capitalist, pro-socialist perspective. So comrades and friends, we owe a great deal of gratitude to Kaepernick and really for all of the, you know, tremendous athletes who are, you know, um, taking so much but really have given so much, you know, in terms of um, optimism and, and, and struggle um, because they're not just sticking to sports, no matter their, their nationality, their gender, or their age. So we look forward to, and we need to figure out how we can support this struggle, you know, as much as we can, because it's, it's going to be in the forefront for a long, long time. So You could say that sports today has been militarized. Um, 
because, like everything else in society. Because it was a time when, you know, the, the, the anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance wasn't done in sports, but it was sort of, I think, it, I think it happened around World War II, if I'm not mistaken, especially in baseball, I mean, I'm sorry, football games, like the, the, the Bears and so forth, where they started to introduce the anthem. And, um, and so because, because sports is so popular, I mean, it's, it's so much uh, interwoven within the, the culture, mass culture of the country. And so it, is, it really is true what Richard said. It is a tool of indoctrination. They can use sports, which should be just, you know, just joyful, joyful and you know, cooperative and so forth, but, but they want to, to interject, you know, militarism, you know, the violence. You know, Trump actually said that the, the game, the NFL games weren't violent enough. He said that. Yeah. When the whole issue of CTE and what happened to Aaron Hernandez, this troubled, you know, wonderful, you know, talented Puerto Rican football player, you know, who was in jail for murder and then committed suicide, and found out that he had CTE, early stages of CTE. He had the brain of a 60-year-old person. He was only 27 when he died. He only played eight years in the NFL, but he was hit so much in the head that this, I mean, really, it's just unheard of. And so when this was raised, when Trump said, well, it's not, you know, these players are too afraid, you know, to hit each other, and it's not violent enough. I mean, it was just, <laughs> just outrageous. <laughs> it's just <laughs> outrageous. And, and I think that's a, a big reason why the NFL is popular as it is, that some of the ratings have gone down. You know, the, popular, the popularity has suffered because of, you know, the CTE and, you know, other factors too. Some of them want to blame it on Kaepernick. But, you know, uh, of course they're going to do that anyway. But, um, but anyway, the militarization of the uh, sports is such a big thing, you know, in terms of the violence, but also, like Richard was saying, the brainwashing. And, and, and the fact is, is that when these players, and it's true what, even what Rod Rubin was saying, the influence of sports figure, these sports personalities are revered. They're like idols, you know, to, to young, not only young men, but, you know, young women too, you know, the WNBA and, and so forth. So when they, when these sports figures do something political, it is heavy. <laughs> it is heavy and, and the bourgeoisie, including the team owners, they're so conscious of this. That's why they want to squash any type of, you know, resistance. The players really haven't resisted yet. They really, I mean, you know, they, they, they've come out in anger against Trump. That's what's unified them because, you know, they, they feel like they've been hit in the gut by Trump. But in terms of resistance, we, you know, we haven't even begun to see <laughs> you know, the real resistance from the players. And this is why Trump is going after them. I really think that's why he's going after them. And that's why the team owners, they must be really, really worried. Because they caught between a rock and a hard place. Because they, because they worry about their profits. But on the other hand, you know, they, they really want someone like Trump, who, who by the way is violating all kinds of eth eth you know, ethic rules. Because the NFL is a private enterprise, and no government official is supposed to interfere in terms of the, you know, the inner workings of an enterprise calling for, for workers to get, I mean, for players to get fired. You know, I think one of Trump's staff members, when she, when she called for Jamil Hill to be fired, that's the Demo some Democratic coalition actually was bringing, up, bringing her up on ethnic ch uh, charges because it's a violation of some type of, you know, federal law or whatever. So why not, you know, but Trump, you know, I guess because he's the president, it's, you know, nobody has said anything about that. But, but it's, it's really true that if the sports, that's why we have to continue to monitor this because this is becoming more and more of a, um, 
you know, I don't want to say debate, but even a, a, a struggle within the entire sports world, where you have sports commentators taking sides <laughs> in terms of siding with the players. You know, they hate Trump, but you know, but they're dealing with, you know, uh, uh, bosses who are trying to like quell, quell any type of you know outburst. You know, um, even amongst their own commentators, like Jamel Hill, and and others like her. So, anyway, it's it's really true. These sports figures, they're they're you know they can play a tremendous role in terms of moving the struggle forward. And um, so, anyway, this is this is what you know we have to keep looking at and and, and seeing how we can intervene in, in the best way to to support these you know to support these players as much as we can.